Welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants are in a listen-only mode until the, answer, the question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. To ask a question at that time, please press star 1 and clearly record your name for question introduction. I would like to now turn the conference over to our host, Linda Lee. Linda, your line is open. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Linda Lee, and thank you for attending today's webinar. I want to welcome everyone to our new series on exploring census data. If you've been following our series, we began in April with the first in the series on international trade. For anyone who may have missed this session, we have our presentation, recording, and transcript archived on our site census.gov found under recorded webinars. Second in the series today is our employment data. For anyone who may have tuned into our 2018 series on employment, today's session will serve as part two, where we will feature additional information not covered in last year's session. In this webinar, our speakers will dive into employment data from our demographic and public sector programs. The webinar is a standalone session where you don't need to have seen part one in order to track along. If you're interested in viewing part one, please visit our site, census.gov, where you will be able to obtain an archived copy of the recording, slides, and transcript. Today's webinar will be presented by Ms. Melinda Kasky, who is a statistician from our public sector program. Our second speaker today is Mr. Chase Sawyer, who is one of our supervisory subject matter experts from our demographic program, the American Community Survey. In a moment, Melinda and Chase will be presenting practical ways to use our employment data to expand your business. Our speakers will also be showing you how to obtain the data using the available data tools. Before we begin, let me give you a quick look into our series. The Exploring Census Data webinar series consists of six webinars presented monthly on popular topics. On the right side of the screen, we have included upcoming topics and session dates. Other items consistent throughout the series is the use of real live case scenarios to illustrate practical ways to use the data. Each of the webinars in the series is presented by subject matter experts with the opportunity for Q&A at the end of each session. And if you miss a webinar, want to refer a colleague to a session that you found to be particularly helpful, or simply would like to view it again, each of the sessions will be recorded and posted at the link provided here. Archived for you here as well is our 2018 series where you will be able to obtain the slides, transcripts, and recordings. So let's begin with general information about the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau is the federal government's largest statistical agency. We conduct over 100 surveys each year with some of our highly visible programs such as the Decennial, the American Community Survey, and the Economic Census listed here. Now out of these 100 plus surveys, over 60 of them collect business data. When it comes to our data, a pyramid is a good illustration of the relationship between details and timeliness. In general, the more timely the data, the less detail, and vice versa. With that being said, the Economic Census is a periodic survey that takes place every five years. It's illustrated at the bottom of the pyramid because it is the most comprehensive program when you're looking for business data. The employment data you will see today is categorized in the middle of the pyramid in the annual survey. Annual surveys are useful for when you need to analyze a trend. On the next slide, I'm going to briefly provide a general overview of our decennial census. The primary purpose of 2020 decennial census is to collect data on population and housing, but there are many other useful information. The data from 2020 helps with drawing congressional state legislative districts, school districts, and voting precincts, distributing over billion dollars worth of funding annually to state and local communities. These outcomes affect every person in the United States, which is why it is important that we have a complete and accurate census. Since the 2020 will touch our lives in the near future, here's a timeline on our activities so you can know what's coming down the road. In March of next year, households will be receiving an invitation to participate and respond. As you can see from the timeline, reminders will be delivered to those who have missed the initial mailings. Every household will have the option of responding online, by phone, or by mail. So what can you do to get involved to help make the 2020 Census a complete and accurate count of the nation's people? Well, you can actively support and spread the word about completing your 2020 Census in your community. 
You can learn more about approximately 500,000 temporary census jobs that may become available in the spring of 2020. You can also remind others that the census is important, easy, and safe. Lastly, you can join your local Complete Count Committee and lend your expertise to ensure all areas of your community are accurately counted in the 2020. At this point, I would like to turn the presentation over to Melinda, who will begin our presentation today on employment. Thank you so much, Linda. Our focus today will be on information from the Census Bureau on employment, more specifically how people can use state and local government employment data to understand the scope and composition of government employees, as well as payroll for those employees. We will also relate how people can use the American Community Survey data to examine employment patterns by industry across the U.S occupational differences, as well as key statistics that are tied to employment. We want to start by focusing in on exactly what the Annual Survey of Public Employment and Payroll, or ASPEP, is. In a very broad brush stroke, ASPEP provides the number of employees and their gross payroll for state and local governments, nationally and by state. They publish specifically the month of March. March was chosen as a good representative month because it avoids measuring temporary employees like summer lifeguards or concession stand clerks that work for parks and recreation departments while not missing any full-time employees like teachers who are out most of the summer. The survey has been conducted since 1957 with a full census of all 90,000 plus state and local governments being collected every five years. The website where you can find the most current data and more information on the data collection methods, the definitions, Get a, take a quick look at the questionnaire are all there here at this link that we've listed below. This webinar is well-timed because our data today is in fact from the most recent Census of Governments data for 2017. Looking at some quick facts about that data, we see that the 2017 March total payroll was approximately $80.3 billion. There were 14.6 million full-time employees and 4.9 million part-time employees in, in government, both at the state and local level. Full-time equivalent employment, employment is one of the really valuable contributions of the ASPEP survey. We convert part-time hours worked, which was 341.6 million in March of 2017, into the equivalent full-time positions. This gives even more dimension onto which exam to examine the employment data. A fundamental difference between the ASPEP employment data and the ACS data, which we'll be discussing soon, is that ASPEP data is collected directly from government entities. ACS uses self-reported data from their survey respondents. Knowing that difference might help you decide which data is best for your particular situation. You may have heard of NAICS code. NAICS is the North American Industry Classification System. And I don't want to go into too much detail about NAICS because the number one thing I would have to say about it is it is completely irrelevant to us. We do not use NAICS in our public sector statistics data. But I do want to mention NAICS because they do have a code for what they call public administration. It's sector 92. You may see this come up in some of the economic surveys or in the economic data sets. Where NAICS differs from ASPEP data, is that NAICS does not always include all government functions, as they often classify some government functions into non-governmental NAICS codes, such as public schools or airport operations, et cetera. This is where some of the value of the ASPEP survey comes in. Since ASPEP keeps all government functions together, it provides a more comprehensive look of go at governments as a whole. I think we're ready to take a look at some of the questions we've been able to answer using this data. Here we are looking at total number of full and part-time employees for state and local governments, broken up by state. It's not at all surprising to find that the states with the highest population also have the largest number of government employees. California, Florida, Illinois, New York, and Texas all spike a little higher. Something really interesting happens when we look at this same data, not broken out by state, but by government function. And look at that. Those two giant bars are for total elementary and secondary education and total higher education. 
This clearly highlights the big impact that education employees have on state and local government employment statistics. Something I'd like to mention is that both of these education categories are a combination of instructional positions and non-instructional positions. Our employment data in ASPEP has them separated and also reported together so you can decide which best meets your needs. ASPEP also separates out police protection into persons with powers of arrest and without powers of arrest, and they separate fire protection out into firefighters and other fire protection roles. If your research would benefit from that finer detail, you can get more specific information about those categories. But in this chart, I only use the totals. This is another way to look at that same data, but it adds another layer. Some categories have been collapsed, but what we really want to see here is the magnitude of the state employees and the local employees. You can see that the local employees are in blue, while the state employees are in green. An interesting result appears again in the education categories. A vast majority of the elementary and secondary employees are local government employees, with just a tiny sliver being state employees. By contrast, a majority of higher education employees are state employees, with a much smaller percentage being local employees. This makes sense with what we understand about how most states administer elementary and secondary schools at a local level and university systems administered at the state level. But there are exceptions, though. My favorite exception is Hawaii. If you look for elementary and secondary education employment for Hawaii, you'll not find it at the local level. In Hawaii, all public education employees are state employees. I wanted to add this chart to demonstrate that you can examine this same data from a payroll perspective. It doesn't look much different from the, from the employment numbers. Some very interesting questions can be answered from examining the payroll numbers, but we only have so much time. So please do explore the payroll data. Make some comparisons and see what you can discover. Now we want to drill down to the state of New York. You can see the breakout of employment categories pretty much mirrors it closely what we saw at the national level. No surprises here. But let's separate out the state employees from the local employees to examine the differences among categories. First, we've separated out only the state government employees. We see slightly higher employment in financial administration, judicial and legal, corrections, hospitals, and higher education. I don't think most people would be surprised to see this result. It follows what's a typical delegation of administration between state and local governments. A characteristic of New York that is only shared by a few other states is that slightly higher spike for transit. We've done a little bit of a call out there. New York has one of the largest transit systems in the world, and you can see over 15,000 state employees work for the transit, but that's only a fraction of transit employees. This is the same chart. But instead of state employees, we've separated out only the local government employees. There are those elementary and secondary educators again. I did add a data call out for transit, since we were just talking about it in the last slide. We can see over 52,000 New York Transit employees are local employees. This is in large part the transit system in New York City. Now as a statistician, this chart is deeply unsatisfying. I know there's a lot going on here, but we have that single category maxing out our scale, so we're losing some of the detail. I really want to see what's happening without that category. So here we are looking at that same New York local government employees, but we've eliminated the elementary and secondary education. So you can see that the data is actually quite rich when it's not being squashed by comparing it to education. Something we could not see when education was in the chart is this nice, tall bar for total police protection. Now, it's easy to think this is only the well-known NYPD, but remember, this is all local governments in New York, so NYPD may be a large part of it, but other communities like Ithaca and Buffalo and Niagara Falls also have their local police counted in this category. We're going to look at another approach for using the ASPEP data. Here, I put these charts side by side because I want you to be able to compare them on the left, we have full-time employees in elementary and secondary education, and on the right, we have part-time employees. 
you can see that 75% of employees that are full-time are in instructional jobs. Looking at the right, part-time employees, we see 56% of part-time employees work in instructional jobs. You could look at several years of data and see if this is an enduring trend or something that's changing over time. When we look at higher education with the exact same data, it flips the script. Full-time instructional positions on the left are 36% in instruction, while on the right, 50% of instructional positions are part-time. You can see that this pattern is a complete reverse of elementary and secondary instruction. People familiar with education institutions will not find this surprising. Rather, it demonstrates something that jives really well with our expectations for these institutions. But I hope it makes you curious about these what these ratios looked like, say, 40 years ago. Or perhaps if we made these same charts using payroll numbers, we might find something pretty interesting as well. Since I did mention transit earlier, and we are talking about New York, I wanted to make this chart. You will not find high numbers of transit employees in every state. In Wyoming, where I used to live, they have 54 full-time equivalent transit employees. This chart is scaled in thousands. You couldn't even see a bar that size on this chart. You notice I switched from full-time and part-time total employment to full-time equivalent. Now, that's not a trick. It's just a subtle reminder that those numbers are available. If you wanted to include, oh, I wanted to include this chart to inspire you to choose a government function that you're interested in and examine it using this ASPEP data. I have one final slide, then I'll be able to turn it over to Chase. I would like to take a minute to mention the state and local government snapshot tool. It's a visualization tool with, we put the link to on the top right you can customize the view by changing multiple selectors, including the year, the government type, the state, or you can, uh, uh, as we can demonstrate here, uh, you can change the variable selector to the employment numbers. This tool does not have all of the ASPEP variables, but it does make it quick and easy to examine some employment numbers. It also features important financial data that you can look at while you're in there. This tool will be updated with new data very soon, so keep checking back. A 30-minute webinar that explains the tool in detail and how to use all of the features can be found at the link where it says webinar on the snapshot tool. Please note that the 2018 Annual Survey of Public Employment and Payroll data will be released this summer. The survey website at the link here will be a good first stop when you're looking for that data. I hope you'll go check out the tool and the newest data. I'm pleased to pass it over to Chase Sawyer, who will be telling us more about employment data. Thank you, Melinda. And so I'm Chase Sawyer, and today I'm going to introduce um, some information about the American Community Survey. The American Community Survey is the nation's largest demographic survey, and it provides information for the nation's most current, reliable, and accessible data for um, topics such as age, children, veterans, commuting, education, income, and employment. There is a vast amount of employment data available, such as employment status, weeks and hours worked, um, full and part-time status, as well as class of worker, which looks at um, whether someone works for a private company, for a government, or for a nonprofit, and also for themselves. Today, we're mostly going to focus on our industry and occupation data, and we'll briefly touch on um, some of our commuting data and health insurance data. Um, for the industry that we're going to focus on today, it'll be on the educational services and health care and social assistance industry, and when available, we'll break that down just specifically to educational services. So the major strength of the American Community Survey is that we create a large range of estimates that are comparable between multiple geographic regions. We have estimates that we provide for the nation, um, states, counties, places, metropolitan areas, and we also go ahead and publish data on um, census tracts and block groups. Just to give some perspective, a census tract 
is about the size of one, um, 1,200 people to 8,000 people, and block groups range from 600 to 3,000 people in size. So you can get very granular data for the entirety of the nation. Just some things to consider about ACS data as compared to um, some of the economic data that we just discussed is that the American Community Survey is a demographic survey which is household based. And because of that, most of the charts that we create are based on where someone lives and not necessarily where they work. We do have a few charts that make this distinction, um, but most charts are going to focus on where people live. And as I was mentioning earlier, we also have information on all types of workers, whether they're um, working at an employer business, they're self-employed, work for a government, or work for a nonprofit. Um, the other thing to consider is that we have one-year and five-year estimates. So for places with more than 65,000 people living there, we're able to provide data um, with one-year estimate time frames for those areas. For places smaller than that, we release um, five-year estimates, which take our rolling data collection and release them for a five-year period, but those are updated every year. The final consideration for this is that while the American Community Survey does not publish data um, using NAICS codes, we do have information on how you can take our census codes and crosswalk them over to the NAICS codes if you're interested. And so to get us started, I thought it would be great to show how we determine um, what an industry is and what an occupation is. And so these are the questions from the uh, mail survey. And as you can see, um, industry, our questions mostly focus on the kind of business and um, the sector that the employer, that the employee works in. Um, some of the examples for the kind of business or industry that we include on the form are elementary school and residential occupation. Or, I'm sorry, residential construction. For our occupation data, we focus more on what a person does for their employer. Some examples of this include fourth grade teacher, an entry level plumber. And we're able to discern, we're able to categorize people based on what they tell us is their main occupation as well as some of the duties they perform. So now we're going to go ahead and take a quick look at an overview of some of the industries in New York City. As you can see, there are some differences um, between the national averages, which I've gone ahead and pointed out using this line in the bar chart. For example, um, fields, or sorry, industries such as agriculture, forestry, fish, fishing and hunting, and mining aren't as prevalent in the city of New York. But other um, fields, such as the educational services, and healthcare and social assistance, there are more people working in New York. We can go ahead and take a deeper dive into that data and see that 9% of the people working in New York City actually work in educational services. We have 250 different census classifications um, for industry, and while they're not avail all available in our um, tables from time to time. They are mostly all available in our public use microdata sample if you're interested in doing an analysis using that. We are able to break out educational services in some tables to um, show information about employment at elementary and secondary schools, at colleges and universities, and um, businesses and technical schools. So now we're going to go ahead and show some of the occupational data um, that we have. And again, you can see that there are some differences um, throughout the country as compared to the country. But the occupation where we're going to see our teachers is that management, business, science, and, and arts occupations. I've gone ahead and broken that out a little more on the next slide. And so here we've dived into the management business science and arts occupations a couple levels deeper, so we're able to get education, training, and library occupations. And you're able to see the um, vast amount of information that we have about um, people working in those fields. 
Um, for occupation, we have 450 different classifications, and again, most of those are available in our public use microdata sample. Next, I want to show that you're able to um, break out our industry and occupation data in a variety of different ways. On this slide, you're able to see us um, looking at industry broken out by occupation. And most of the people in New York City are in the field um, that we're actually studying today. They are in the educational services and healthcare and social assistance industry, and their occupation is um, doing something that is management, business, science, or arts occupations. And some of the um, other breakouts here that are shown with a darker color are some of the more popular um, ones in New York City. There are additional breakouts available, though, um, such as looking at industry and occupation data by race and, race and ethnicity, sex, class of worker, which we discussed before, which is um, looking at people that work for private businesses, governments, um, or are self-employed. We also can provide earnings by occupation and information about commuting and journey to work. This visualization published on the Census Bureau website um, actually shows some of the earnings by occupation data that we have available. And in this situation, we've also broken it out um, by males and females. So hopefully this helps to illustrate some of the data that you would be able to gather from the American Community Survey. Um, before we move on to our commuting and journey to work data, I think it's important to show the difference with the American Community Survey between earnings and income. Earnings is mostly what Melinda was talking about with government workers and how much they earn um, from their job with those agencies. The American Community Survey asked a number of questions, though, about um, income people have, such as retirement income, um, VA payments, Social Security, and public assistance. And so when we take all of this information, we call that is the concept of income for us, whereas earnings is just what someone earns from self-employment or as a wage or a salary. So that's important to keep in mind as you're looking at the tables and the information that we have in the American Community Survey. Another topic that we um, briefly touched on is that we have commuting and journey to work data, which may be helpful in um, determining how long people take to get to work throughout the country and how they get there. And this visualization shows some of the statistics that we've created um, using this information. The last topic I'd like to touch on before we talk about accessing the data is that um, we have health insurance data. And this we'll dive into a little more deeply um, as we get to July in our webinar series. All right, and so there's many ways to access American Community Survey data. Um, a few of them are listed on the side, and I've mentioned before um, the public use microdata sample. Um, the major way that we have right now to access data is American Fact Finder, but that will be retiring in um, June of this year. There will be no more data added to that platform. And so I'm going to go ahead and take a moment to show how you can access some industry and occupation data using um, what will be our new platform which is data.census.gov. All right, and so I'm going to start here um, by showing you just go ahead and type in data.census.gov. This information um, added on the side that will auto-populate, but if you type in that, you'll find where you need to go. And here I'm going to start by typing in industry and occupation. and so We'll be able to find the tables um, that we have for that. And so on this first screen here, you have um, the tables that we have, we also have the ability to look at maps and some of the popular web pages. But we're going to just look at the tables today and how I gather some of the data for this presentation. All right, and so when you click tables, you'll see that there are multiple tables here on the left. We've given most of the real estate to um, the actual table itself, though, so you can see the information that's there. But I'll go ahead, and this is the table I use to create that visualization for the breakout. I also want to go ahead and show you how you can get that information by geography. So you're able to go ahead and change the geography here. 
and you see there's the United States, a variety of different geographies that you may access the information for, but we look at state here. We're going to scroll down and we're able to select the state of New York, and that has now been added um, as a filter to our table. The other way you can access um, different geographies right now is to type it into the filter. So what I'll do here is type in New York City. That goes ahead and pops up as a geography that we can use. Now that's been added as well. So I'll go ahead and close these um, out here and you're able to see that now we have data um, on this information for New York and New York City. I also want to go ahead and show you how you can download um, that information. So we go ahead and we scroll up here and you can click on download. You can select the years of data that you're interested in. I'll go ahead and select 2017. You just select download. And now that information is available for you and you'll have um, files available for your download in a WinZip format. All right, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass um, the mic back over to Linda so she can finish out our presentation. Thank you, Melinda and Chase, for presenting our audience with different programs and ways to use Census Bureau's employment data to help expand business markets. So let's sum up some of the ways you can use the information you've seen today. From our public sector program, information about government employees can help you strategize the location of your business. For instance, if you were to open a government contracting company, you would probably want to locate your company in areas with high concentration of government workers. Or if you're interested in knowing the level of government service, such as police protection for your business, you can get this information from our public sector program. From our American Community Survey, we are able to provide many types of data from occupational breakouts, journey to work, and demographics for the location of your business. The information you obtain from our ACS allows you to examine employment patterns across the United States in order to help you guide certain business decisions. These are just some of the examples and ways that you can use our employment data for your needs. With that being said, now that we've seen different ways employment data can be helpful to your business needs, an important part of providing gold standard data to you is to promote response. If you or anyone you know receive our survey, your response matters. So please encourage others you know to participate. Before we begin the Q&A, here's a look into what's coming up next month. Third in the series is a webinar on emergency management scheduled for June the 5th at 2 p.m. To learn more about this upcoming webinar, please visit the link provided here. Thank you everyone for taking the time out of your busy day to attend today's webinar. At this time, we would like to open up our phone lines to take any questions you may have about our employment data. In addition to our speakers today, we have additional subject matter experts here in the room to help assist with questions, so you may hear additional speakers on the line. Also, if you have questions regarding the 2020 decennial, please contact the telephone number provided on this slide. Operator, at this time, do we have questions? Yes, there is one question in queue from Leslie Beatty. Go ahead, Leslie. Uh, several times during the show. Let's see your line is open. Leslie, could you please repeat your question? I don't have that. We do have another question in port from Albiel Numa. Go ahead, Albiel. Yes, um, good afternoon and thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question especially in regards to um, industry I guess um, numbers or statistics, especially when it comes to having an idea of the cost of services um, that are provided in the area or in an area that's applicable to your business services so that you could get a range in terms of determining your pricing. What would be the best, um, I guess, census data to help with that in terms of industry? 
um, standards or industry numbers? Um, so it seems that your question is um, a little bit more specific to your type of business, um, and it's um, let me see, I, CBB. Um, let me confer with my colleagues real fast. Hold on, please. Okay, no problem. So thank you for asking that question. That's more of a um, general data user question that um, relates to our other program that is not related to the topic today. Um, okay. What you can do is submit your question and it should come to my office, which is the Data User Outreach and Education, and we will provide an answer for you. Okay, and you are, um, let's see, our information, are you Melinda? I am Linda. How, however, you can submit your question at, at the bottom. Census okay, the census ask. ask. Okay, great. And then one other question. In terms of um, developing a business plan and, you know, looking at demographic data as well as, you know, occupational data as you showed there, what is a good way to access that information? Is it through the census? Gov, as um, the gentleman showed us initially, or is there another set of data that would be more applicable? So one of the greatest um, thing about the question that you just asked is we do have a data tool that is designed to do something exactly like that. And okay. when, you when you ask that question um, via email, go ahead and include this question, and we can contact you and walk you through exactly um, using right. one of our data tools. Okay, and one last question. I promise this is the last one. Um, will we get a copy of the presentation and also where can we go online to um, sign up for additional webinars or register for the additional rep webinars that you all showed um, here on the presentation? Sure. So um, the recording for today's webinar should be posted on our site. and. Um, for additional webinars, if you subscribe, um, you should be getting the, all the emails and notifications. Okay, okay. Thank you. We have a good question online submitted by text. They were asking why the employment data that we were talking about, the government data, didn't include the federal government. Um, the Census of Governments was a program that was chartered by Congress in the 1950s, and basically our mission is to um, collect the uh, data for all state and local governments in the U.S. That obviously doesn't include the federal government itself. However, federal government data are available from the Office of Personnel Management. Divide and conquer. <laughs> our next question comes from Cynthia Mobis. Go ahead, Cynthia. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Um, I had um, just a few questions as far as the resources you were providing us with or um, the divisions. One was American Community Survey. I couldn't hear it clearly. And then what was the other one, ASPEC something? That's right, ASPEP, -E the Annual Survey of Employ uh, Employment, uh, Public Employment and Payroll. So ASPEC, okay. Yeah, PEP. EP, okay. And then right. the other one was the American Community Service? That's yes. right. Okay. And I, I wasn't able to view this online, so I was wondering what did I do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll certainly be able to post it, not only as a transcript, uh, as a webinar, but also as a PowerPoint. Uh, so you'll be able to take a look at it again, and you can still email us questions. Uh, uh, but we'll put it under, uh, what was it again, Linda? The census.askdata at census.gov. And it'll be under uh, recorded webinars. Oh, you're talking okay. about on our site. Census on census.gov, um, you can actually search for Census Academy, and once you search for Census Academy, you, uh, we have recorded webinars and also upcoming webinars, so you can see what's coming up in the future. Okay, so when I do it at that time, and I'll let you go, 
how do I view it um, in real time? Okay, so it's going to be posted as a YouTube a YouTube video, and um, we also have transcript and um, audio. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. You've been very helpful. We did have someone asking about um, whether local governments included a breakout by borough, by county, uh, that sort of a detail. And now because we're public sector, uh, none of our data is private, so we do actually publish what they call a unit file that has all of those level of detail. Uh, it, it, for the average user, it takes a little bit of you know, finesse to get that information out of there. But uh, in that unit file, you can find down to the single government level uh, for local governments. Our next question comes from Ihan Fon. Go ahead, Ihan. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it was a great overview. My question kind of was along the lines of the last question in terms of whether or not there could be zip code level information. Uh, because we are huge consumers of geographical data um, and sometimes to f sort of pit one geographic area against another, we um, do so at the zip code level or aggregate it up um, according to our local markets. But um, would that information also be downloadable? Yeah, and so the American, perhaps, yeah, the American Community Survey um, does publish data. It's called a ZICTA. It's like a census level equivalent to zip code. Um, there's some different information about um, making those comparisons, but in a lot of cases that's going to line up right with your zip code um, data. And then as far as the government employment or government employment statistics, governments frequently overlap zip codes. They have no regard for a zip code barrier <laughs> and, uh, and encompass multiple counties or you know multiple districts. So uh, we don't have the government data at that level, but hopefully you would be able to uh, you know, uh, determine which governments operate in your area that you're concerned about and then include those. Our next question comes from Vanessa Sparks. Go ahead, Vanessa. Hi, and actually, good uh, afternoon. Uh, Vanessa Sparks from New York City, Community Board 12 in Queens, New York. But actually, you answered my question. I just wanted to know if the presentation would be available for um, print so we can just have it as a reference. And you actually answered the question um, before, so thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Our next question comes from Polly McDonald. Go ahead, Polly. Oh, hi. Good afternoon. I actually have three questions. Um, the first question is, uh, I think in Mr. Sawyer's one of the slides, uh, one of the slides says, uh, ACS data industry breakout by census code, not by NAICS. So, um, and you mentioned there's a crosswalk. Um, mm -hmm. Where can I find that crosswalk file? So. It's a long web address, so I'm not going to bother saying it over the phone, okay. but I will slide back here to where it was so you can go ahead and copy it down. But yeah, that's, that's actually a question we got on the web as well. This is where you would find the crosswalk at the web address at the bottom of the slide. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and then uh, if you don't mind, I'll hold it right there for a second. Let me take a quick picture of it. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, yeah, thank you. Be, okay, yeah, the okay. second question is, um, well, um, for the ACS data, I think you mentioned the new site data.census.gov. Um, mm -hmm. Can we pull the data by industry um, and then by occupation group by geographic area? Yeah, and so I just showed how you can um, get the data for the state of New York and for the city of New York, but all of the different geographic components of that are available for ACS data are available there in the site. Um, okay. So feel free to look at what geographic area you need and if you have any questions or have any feedback, there's a um, email address given there at the bottom of the site which is um, sedside.feedback at census.gov. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, one last question is actually from my boss. She wondered if the ACS data um, have, has citizenship data. Can we pull data filtered by citizenship? Yeah, so there, the citizenship question is asked on the um, ACS form, and okay. um, there are different tables 
that are um, you're able to break out citizenship status. I'm not certain if you can do um, industry and occupation mm -hmm. by citizenship status, but there are data there. Okay, thank you. I'll, I will go check it out. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, someone online was asking about where to find private employer information that would, uh, you know, complement the government's employer information. And uh, one of the best resources we have that explains that is the previously recorded employment webinar. Uh, if you can go to recorded webinars, you'll find an amazing presentation done uh, by our own Linda Lee and uh, uh, Erlene uh, Dowell. And they actually do use NAICS code, and that is in, uh, from our um, economic surveys, uh, so please do take a look there. You'll find a lot of great resources for finding private sector employment. One other question they had online was, uh, do we cover Puerto Rico or the island areas uh, in our survey? And the answer is that we don't. Uh, it's something that we uh, would like to do in the future, and we'll continue those conversations, but as of right now, we don't. All right, and um, just for the ACS side, we do have um, data for um, Puerto Rico. It's um, from the Puerto Rico Community Survey, but we publish it under the same table names. Sometimes um, if we ask the question slightly differently in Puerto Rico, those table names are annotated with PR at the end, but um, the American Community Survey does have that data available. Our next question comes from Max Cherubin. Go ahead, Max. Uh, yes, uh, question. I'm from uh, 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 San Bernardino County of California, and the question I have for you is why don't you talk about the West Coast? Why are you just talking about the East Coast? <laughs> so in our webinar series, um, we try to keep a consistent format where we use a use case, and um, we specifically just um, pick one state, one geographic area to tie in as a, as a thread between both surveys. So there wasn't um, a particular reason for picking East or West Coast. We'll make sure we mix it up. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Of yeah. course. Thank you. Our next uh, question from, comes from Eduardo Rodriguez. Go ahead, Eduardo. Uh, Pedro, uh, this, my question is, uh, in relationship to uh, public workers, uh, the, how they commute to work, are you also now recording uh, whether people use scooters, uh, 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 Uber, or Lyft, or all those forms? Is, is, are you going to start collecting that data? I know because in Philadelphia we invest a lot of money creating bike lanes, which uh, people in scooters and skateboards are using to go to work, and I'm try, curious, curious to see how many public workers are utilizing that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so. At this time, it's not really broken out that way. Um, we're continually doing research on it, and I know that that's something that's come up that we know is a data need and something that we're looking at um, adjusting. So, yeah, thank you for pointing that out, and I'll um, definitely pass that along that we had interest here on that information as well. And then the other thing I wanted to add that just in question of the citizenship question, since you already collect that on the ACS, it shows that it's not needed on the census form. I'm sorry, what's your question in particular, in specific? I was just making a comment. Since the ACS already collects the information on citizenship, therefore it's not needed to be included in the census form for 2020. Oh, okay. Thank right. you. Well, thanks for that feedback. Uh, someone online is asking if they can share this uh, webinar, this information in a, in a classroom to help their students to uh, do better research on getting data, and they absolutely can. Uh, feel free to share this information as broadly as you'd like. Our next question comes from George. Go ahead, George. Hi, yes. Uh, I was looking at county industry level data that complements the two surveys you mentioned, the ACS and the payroll survey, uh, do either one of them provide uh, like uh, industry level data by county or would that be only by the county business patterns uh, survey? Yeah, and so with the American Community Survey, we have, um, we have data for every county. We have very granular level data, um, like I mentioned, down to the census tract and block group, so that's definitely available um, through the ACS. 
Yeah, on, on the public sector side, it's, it's not something we really condone. Um, government boundaries, aside from counties themselves, often cross county boundaries. So doing a presentation for county area is nearly impossible because we really don't measure at that level. And I'll, I'll give you an example. A third of all school districts in the U.S. cross county boundaries due to consolidation, et cetera. And then the question would come, well, how would you even prorate the teachers? So it's not something we, we actually attempt. Well, yeah, and the reason yeah the reason we're able to do it with ACS is we're basing it on households households which yeah. are have a physical location yep so you're easy yeah. to yeah it's it, easy to do that whereas it's not with the yeah. with the government okay so in terms of uh, sorry uh, the private industry data then it would I would probably have to reach out to the county business patterns for that right then or so I should, you know when the latest data is coming out for that. So yes, if you're looking for county level data for the private um, industry, it would be the county business pattern. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah, while that's available through ACS, it's going to be based on where someone lives on almost all of our tables as opposed to county business patterns that's going to look at where the business is right. located. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, thank and, you. Uh, one last question, sorry, about I was trying to find where to locate the data releases for those or any uh, surveys it says like vague months is there a date where I can find the data releases for the latest all these surveys that come out sure so if you go on our site census.gov if you're interested in any particular survey there should be a release schedule um, and if you cannot find it feel free to send me an email at the asset um, at the last um, Oh, can we go back to the... Right. Email us at census.askdata at census.gov and we can help you find it. Yeah, and for specifically for the American Community Survey, um, I'm actually working on those pages right now, so that will be on our website within the next few days here if you um, go to the ACS website and look at updates. Okay, thank you. There's a question online from Alfred. He says that he uses the, uh, the county business patterns data, and he'd like to find out how that the AFPEP data is different from the county business patterns data uh, and, and uh, in regard to the self-employment uh, and establishments. Self-employment? So, I mean, self-employment would, uh, you know, no man is his own government. Uh, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what the context of that question is. So, I mean, the the, um, the public sector, the government state on employment is basically um, characteristics of people who are employed by governments. So there would be no self-employment data in that data set. So I wanted to um, further ask the question of when you refer to self-employment, um, we do have non-employer statistics. Um, I'm not sure if this is something that um, that's kind of related to what you're asking. We need more clarification and, um, de and details in order to answer that question. But if a lot of um, um, so, if you check out the non-employer statistics, those are for as um, I want to say company establishments that do not report employees. Mm -hmm. Our next question comes from Alfred Garcon. Go ahead, Alfred. Yes, uh, it was my question that was, that was just answered, but uh, just for clarity, um, uh, specifically I was asking how different uh, the county business patterns data is from the, uh, the ASPEP data at the county level. And uh, with regards to the self-employed establishment uh, question, I was asking how, how does, um, sorry, uh, um, I was asking whether the county business patterns data include uh, data, data on self-employed establishment. Okay, so um, thank you for the clarification. Um, I will try my best to answer your question. We do not have a county business pattern subject matter expert here in the room, but I do know about the program. So the county business pattern actually measure establishments with employees, and the counterpart to that is the non-employer statistics. Um, you can get that on our site under all surveys and um, surveys and program and all surveys, and it's listed in alphabetical order. So that's the non-employment non-employee statistics. Um, the acronym for that is NES. 
So when you go there, that's the equivalent of um, the county business patterns for establishments that report zero to zero employees. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Marcelino. Go ahead, Marcelino. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Hopefully you can hear me clearly. I'm looking over your data, census.gov, and I'm looking under the data profiles. I see United States, Los Angeles, and New York City. Is there any way that, that uh, a feature can be added there where uh, the user can just click on it? Same presentation that you see for each of these three files, profiles, but uh, there can be a filter, a very high-level filter for the city or the county itself. That way it will replicate basically what you created there. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I believe there are um, different profiles available. It's not just um, those few cities. Like I believe every um, state has a profile like that. Um, so I mean, I like your suggestion though. I'm not currently involved with that product, but if you leave that, there should be that little email down in the left corner left bottom corner that you can go ahead and click and submit feedback and we're we're doing everything we can to kind of update that and um, get data users what they need so that would be the best way to make those suggestions thank you thank you for everything you do this is a nice website by the way way, way better than the last one that you have thank you <laughs> okay, well great thank you and, and there's someone who's asking what's the next webinar and date linda the next webinar is on emergency management and it is on june the 5th And there are no further questions in queue. All right, we have reached the top of the hour and there are no further questions. If anyone else has a question um, after this session, please feel free to send your questions to uh, the contact information here. And thank you for attending today's webinar. Have a great day. Thank you for attending today's conference. It is now concluded. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Speakers, please allow for a moment of silence and stand by for post-conference.